Well, welcome to the first orientation or the first uh, presentation section of uh, the Learning Analytics and Knowledge 2012 Open Online course. As uh, you may be aware, if you've had a chance to dive through the discussion forum, we have a very diverse group of learners who have some fairly uh, different skill sets and, uh, and experiences, uh, both with data and with the course format. So what we're hoping to do, or what I'm hoping to do with the session here today at least, is to give you a quite a broad overview of what learning analytics are as a field. So I'm not here necessarily to provide a specific definition of learning analytics. Uh, there are a few online uh, that uh, we can, I'll link to anyways, you can have a look at. But, uh, and by this I mean online, I'm referring to the, uh, uh, the JISC or the CDIS Learning Analytics Series, as well as the Society for Learning Analytics Research. So if you're interested in definitions and if that's the sort of thing that makes you, uh, helps you make sense of the world, I'll certainly drop a few of those links in later. Mainly though, what I'd like to do is give you sort of a contextual overview. You know, how did we get to where we are now? What have been some of the contributing fields that uh, have provided either a foundation for what we do when we talk about learning analytics or in some capacity have contributed so that we can get a sense of what is someone who is involved in learning analytics? What kinds of activities are they engaged in? And for that matter, what's the research base that already exists? So we'll dive right in. Um, by way of a bit of a history, I'm going to take a fairly large arc going back to about the mid-40s and uh, basically touch on a variety of fields. Some have been more influential in what we today see as learning analytics and some are more peripheral and it's nice to be aware of. The aspect of analytics in education that's worth, uh, worth emphasizing, and we talked about this briefly during our orientation sessions is that analytics have different roles in organizations or in higher education. So at one level, you may have what's best defined as academic analytics. And these are activities that are focused on improving the education functioning or the functioning of the education system. So basically, it's there as, uh, as a university uh, to improve its operation. That draws heavily from business intelligence. I'm not focusing very much on that aspect. Instead, I'm looking at the ways in which we can come to understand what happens in a classroom or what happens in an online course or in the learning experience as a whole. Now, one of the first uh, examples or attempts to try and provide some kind of a of a view of what we can do by understanding the uh, interactions that happen is by Paul Lazarsfeld. And this was going back to uh, 1940s, where he made the statement of who talks to whom about what and to what effect. And that really forms what I think today is still largely the area of interest or the target within social network analysis. So the big attempt here is to understand how is it that people are connected? And if we understand how people are connected, does that give us any insight into what's happening as a result of their interactions? Now, shortly, uh, um, I should mention a uh, journal impact factor. Um, journal citations, I'm not sure I put 1995. That's supposed to be 1955. Uh, so Garfield has been quite active, or had been at least, on looking at the structure of science. You know, how is it that science develops as a field? and how do connections between articles and scientists, how they reference one another, the resources that they include, how important are those, and so on. So that was uh, in 1955 where he started to look at journal uh, citations to get a sense of the structure of science. Now interestingly, and many of you are probably aware of this, but uh, that was the basic idea between what eventually became, uh, well at that point I guess it was called Backrub, but eventually became uh, PageRank, which we now recognize, or at least uh, in the early days of Google, was one of the key ways of understanding uh, the structure of a field by looking at connections and the importance of connections. So as Larry Page wrote in his uh, article, in the, uh, to sort of launch Google, if you will, where he talked about PageRank, mentioning an approximation of the importance of a particular resource. So we see here, even, you know, and again, we're looking at, you know, back in the, in the 40s and in the 50s, but what we're essentially seeing develop is that as 
data increases, individuals, researchers, or just you know business folks are trying to understand what is it that is happening in this field that we might not be able to track the way that we perhaps could have in the past. So as a result of that, this attention of understanding traces between entities as a way of making sense of a discipline is evident. Now, moving forward, and this would come back into uh, the 70s, uh, well, I guess you go, uh, with Milgram's uh, six degrees experiment as well, but uh, certainly Barry Wellman has been very active in social network analysis, as has, you know, uh, Granovetter's work on uh, the, uh, the strength of weak ties. And that's, at this point, still probably one of, the, well, the most cited article in sociology, but probably one of the most cited articles in social sciences. And essentially what he argued was that uh, we gain novel insight, not from people that we already know, but rather from weak ties. So people that, uh, who have different knowledge than what we have, we might have lost track of them since high school or since university, but uh, we normalize to a degree knowledge with our tight connection. So if we're looking for a job, for example, we will have a better chance of finding new information through weak connections. And that's quite a critical uh, insight into the benefit of diverse social networks. Now, Carolyn Haythorn-Thwaite, who's now with uh, UBC, has uh, addressed learning networks quite extensively in her research, as well as the way that different types of media can impact the formation of networks. So again, there's this development of social network analysis as a field, and it's a very developed base as well. That's can, through a range of metrics and different approaches, can define the importance of a particular node, the value of information exchange, the way that uh, clusters are connected to one another, structural gaps that might exist within those networks, and so on. So this is, out of all the areas of what we would now call, or what I would at least call learning analytics, definitely uh, social network analysis is the most developed aspect of that. And then if you go back or forward, depending on uh, how you're tracing our uh, review here, but the development in the, in the 70s of user modeling, and it's fascinating to think that uh, in the 70s, attention was already being paid to the importance of computers being able to respond individually to, uh, to people, not necessarily the same response for everyone, but the ability, as, uh, as Rich put it in a paper in 79, and if anybody wants these links and citations, there they'll all be in the uh, foot or the notes section of the PowerPoint. And uh, so emphasis was on being able to treat individuals uh, as, as individuals with distinct personalities and goals. And, and even today, I mean, that's a goal certainly educationally, but also just in general web use activity as well to be able to customize or to treat that as a personal experience. Now, where it starts to get uh, increasingly relevant for, for uh, learning analytics is the activity around cognitive models. And I, I could add a few subsets to this, but cognitive models is basically looking at how learners develop their knowledge. And that, in turn, led into, with a similar group as well, but led into the development of cognitive tutors, which, uh, through Carnegie Mellon, has uh, extensive and significant contributions to the research base. Now, cognitive tutors are uh, a, a link to a part of, or at least somewhat acquainted with, uh, what's also known as intelligent tutors. Understanding, in this case, uh, Burns addressed an article about three levels of intelligent tutors that need to be able to understand domain knowledge, evaluate learner knowledge, and also intervene pedagogically. So again, going back to whether we're looking at from a cognitive tutor or an intelligent tutor perspective, we can start to see the early formation of uh, systems that understand very loosely their users, but also systems that are intended to intervene when concerns or challenges arise. Now, looking back into or forward into the 90s, knowledge discovery in databases, and that's taken on a variety of different terms and probably is most responsible now for uh, the data mining field, uh, certainly educational data mining, but uh, it's got a very broad goal, but a very important one, especially as quantity of information has increased dramatically since the mid-90s. And that's looking at how or what kind of methods or techniques, I should say, what kinds of methods or techniques are needed in order to be able to understand what is an increasingly significant amount of data? How can we make sense of the data that's available, and how can we use 
tools to improve the experience of uh, the individual users so that we can, because we literally can't interact with large quantities of data at the capacity that we need to understand it. So we need to develop systems and methods and approaches. Now, in 2000 and then, well, late 90s as well, but this is as the web was developing in prominence, there was attention being paid to adaptive hypermedia, and this, you know, almost reads, uh, well, reads quite similar to early attempts to try and define systems that adjust to their users, and this was uh, the Rich article that I referenced from 1979. Again, the same idea or similar idea, which is understanding the individual user and being able to adapt to the needs of that user. User. Which then finally on this slide, and I'll pause for questions right after this, I've tried to sort of tease this out through each of these individual areas as, as I talked about them, but you end up with the development of both social network analysis, with user modeling, with uh, trying to map a knowledge domain, map learner cognition and approaches, you end up with a sense of systems that have for probably 30 plus years attempted to define a learner or the understanding that a learner has. Um, secondly, the tracing and mapping of knowledge, which we'll get into quite a bit more detail in this course when we, during our week on uh, the semantic technologies and intelligent curriculum. And then looking at uh, using technology to make that experience, in this case interaction, more efficient, but for our purposes we'll use the language of learning. And then finally, systems that start to compare a learner level of knowledge with the content that they need to master to be competent in that domain. And again, this is hardly new and we sometimes speak about learning analytics as a new idea and a new concept and certainly the popularity of the term has increased over the last three or four years, but the history of what's contributing to learning analytics as a field today uh, goes back significantly. So let me pause there before I continue to talk about sort of data, shifts in data perspectives and the importance of, of uh, analytics in making sense of large quantities of data. So if there's any questions, feel free to drop them in the text box or if anybody would like to take the mic, we can, uh, I'll release it as well. So just give it about 30 seconds or so in case anybody would like to uh, direct any questions or comments. All right, well, that probably wasn't 30 seconds, but it felt like it because dead silence has that uh, amplifying effect. Okay, so if you agree with this sort of assessment and the influence that it's had, then uh, you'll see where we are entering from a learning analytics or an educational data mining perspective. This is what I would look at as being more the trajectory or the history of learning analytics. Now there's a few elements that need to be considered that are important as well. Uh, one is and this is probably reflected best uh, within a variety of fields that are heavily data centric. So looking at artificial intelligence and looking at machine learning. In, that, in those fields at least, it's sort of heavily prefaced by a perspective that we are entering a, you know, a new era of uh, almost a different method of science altogether, where we're no longer uh, looking at the traditional scientific methods, but we've added a, an additional layer, or an additional approach to understanding the world, and that is a data intensive approach. And certainly with machine learning, you know, with the popularity of Watson and uh, other activities by researchers in this space, it, that's almost mind numbing in terms of its development, you can understand where this strong bias for analysis of data as a replacement for traditional hypothesis testing or uh, research development. There's an article, probably many of you have seen it, but it the Wired, uh, Anderson and Wired talked about how the development of data is really nullifying traditional scientific methods because now we crunch data instead of uh, traditional hypothesis testing and that's largely based on, it's actually a very informative book but it's a data intensive scientific discovery. It's a Microsoft research book and I believe you can grab it for a uh, free download, at least I have a PDF copy somewhere. 
Now, this also fits in with uh, Peter Norvig, who is, wrote a paper on the unreasonable effectiveness of data and has a good uh, presentation at, uh, available online that he did for UBC, where he talks about the ways in which we can use data to understand it, in his case being from Google, obviously, the experiences of their end users. So it's a Quite honestly, it ends up being, you know, a different way of thinking or an entirely different approach to understanding the world than what we've perhaps uh, been accustomed to so far. Now, not everyone agrees with this, uh, you know, from a counter view in a paper that was done by uh, uh, by Vardy in, um, in uh, 2010, and uh, this was published in ACM. Let me just see if I've got this. AC, Communications of ACM, uh, volume 53, number 9. But like I mentioned, all of these, these links will be in the PowerPoint if anybody wants. Uh, emphasizes that, you know what? No, actually, uh, those theory and experimentation are still the two pillars of science or the two legs of science. And so the argument put forward is that science only has two legs. So you know, be aware that not everybody is completely in love with this data-centric uh, view of the world. But at least in terms of media attention and area of interest, in research as well, definitely uh, data and analytics are a significantly hot topic. Okay, so that's the um, machine learning, artificial intelligence kind of a perspective as well. The uh, and a few other areas that I'd like to look at. <clears throat> One is business intelligence, and if you're familiar with IBM Cognos or uh, SAS, Tableau, InfoChimps being one, InfoChimps being one of the newer ones. Uh, Tableau, I guess, also would be uh, still considered close to a startup. Uh, there's been a variety of players in this space that go back since really the late 70s and that's essentially with the goal of better understanding what happens in a business and using that for lack of a better word actionable intelligence or something along those lines that allows companies to understand what's happening. Now that as a premise or a base, I, I think this is hopefully obvious to everyone, but certainly statistical uh, knowledge or familiarity, basic familiarity with math at least, is obviously required at the uh, analysis end of any kind of data. And that produces a model something like this. Uh, this is a simple view, and I know both Drew Conway and, and I think Hillary Mason have mentioned that this is a simplified view. It's obviously much more complex than that, but they were trying to add this notion of what is a data scientist and um, this is sort of the image they came up with that sort of intersects between having a high level of technical uh, or hacking, you know, programming, Python skills, creativity and inquisitiveness and uh, having a strong math stats knowledge and how that sort of fits in with data science, machine learning and, and traditional research. It is a simplified view, but again, I'm just trying to emphasize that these approaches or views of the data and analysis are what has, to varying capacities, contributed to learning analytics. So the first segment that I went through is what I would look at as a more traditional heritage, not maybe not even more traditional, but at a, at a more accurate representation of the, the factors that have contributed to the development of learning analytics. The last half dozen slides that I looked at where I was talking about uh, business intelligence and uh, data science, those are certainly important and peripheral. Um, stats knowledge and math knowledge is obviously central to any kind of analysis, but when we the language that we use in analytics, you'll see quite quickly draws, I think, heavier from the intelligent tutor, the social network analysis field, and so on. So once again, I'm going to pause briefly if there are any questions before I sort of uh, run through my last seven or eight slides. I see a few folks are, uh, are typing away, and I'll pause as questions uh, come in. How many people do you, you know, Ben, that's a great question. I don't think there are very many people that embody these skills. I'm just, this was just an example of sort of from a data scientist perspective, and there's quite a bit of criticism on whether data scientist is actually a term. When I think of a learning analytics approach, though, I would see it as team-based, which means that as you're pulling together a learning analytics team, you would likely have individuals who have programming experience. You would likely have folks who are, uh, you know, let's say quite statistically competent and so on. So there's a variety of approaches that um, you know, individuals can take 
to building a team out. So it's not important. As, in fact, I think it's increasingly unrealistic to expect one person to possess the knowledge or the technical skills that are required to be proficient in a particular field. Yeah, absolutely. So anyways, uh, for those of you that are feeling like, wow, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of information that we have to master to be a part of that, you know, I would say be aware. I mean, you certainly want to have some level of familiarity. So if somebody's talking to you about regression or if someone's talking to you about, uh, you know, knowledge domains, uh, you, you want to at least be able to be, I think, able to converse in that, but recognizing that an effective data team or an effective analytics team is going to have quite a few folks involved. Okay, um, so uh, turning now, because part of what I wanted to talk about here is the learning analytics space and what that looks like. So educational data mining as a, a discipline, if you will, uh, has been around since I guess they, they kicked off their conference series, and I believe this was sometime in the uh, in 19 or sorry 2008. They had been running a series of events that were uh, connected to existing conferences several years prior. But in 2008, the educational data mining community started their conference series, and then in 2009, they initiated uh, the, edu the Journal of Educational Data Mining. And that's a free online journal, so anyone can access it or uh, look at the, the conference proceedings. The uh, Society for Learning Analytics Research that targets learning analytics specifically came by a bit later. Uh, the, the conference, the first conference was held in 2011, but conversations were initiated in 2010 around learning analytics. And uh, the Journal of Learning Analytics was launched in 2012. And if you go to the main website, uh, I think there's a current call for papers out to the inaugural issue of that journal. And that's an open access journal as well. So those are the two fields. There's a fair bit of overlap and collaboration within those fields as well. Both of them, I think, have quite a similar goal or a mandate of trying to understand data to improve student experiences. Now, in this talk, and I'll get to this right at the, the final slide, I'm not going to spend time looking at the particular tools and techniques of analytics. That's the topic for week three. You know, what is it that people try to do with data, you know, whether it's predict learner success or whether it's trying to understand how the structure of social networks impacts the uh, successful completion of students in an academic program, or even how uh, you can, uh, you know, train tutoring models to provide learners with with uh, you know, quality support and so on. That's beyond the scope of our focus here, but I'll get into that uh, when I do a short intro to week three. You'll, you'll have um, an overview presentation to look at that, as well as obviously get your hands onto a variety of tools. Now, the, uh, what I'd like to sort of spend a bit of time on now is talking about what is analytics from a little bit more of a systemic perspective. So you have a bit of an understanding if that was the history of analytics and, and learning analytics until we understand it today, the contributing fields, then what's involved in understanding uh, systemic deployment of analytics. And this is a slide I've used uh, numerous times to try and communicate just the challenges around understanding or recognizing analytics development or deployment in universities. So it's, it's not accurate to say that uh, analytics is new. Um, and, and it's not accurate to say that analytics is ground zero. Uh, meaning that you know no one's been doing this until learning analytics came along. Hopefully the review I had sort of gave you that, that overview. Now what is happening in almost any university is that there is some level of analytics happening somewhere. Now this might be uh, you know just a faculty member who has access to let's say learning management system logs that is uh, looking at who's logging in, who's accessing course readings. Might be someone that's uh, using a tool like uh, Snap to try and analyze social networks that are uh, being developed through learner interaction. It might be someone who is uh, using a, you know, a program they developed or that they're familiar with that does text analysis or so on. So there's likely in any university, even a small system, there will be some type of analytic activity going on in the university. The problem with this, and on the one hand it's great that this is a perspective or mindset of faculty, but the difficulty is you can't move up to higher quality 
interventions, uh, discovery of patterns that influence success and failure, and so on. So that challenge is one that requires a coordinated or uh, a team-based approach, and this gets back to the question that uh, Ben answer, asked earlier as well, which is, you know, <laughs> who actually has all these skills? So a coordinated team is going to have a variety of skill sets, everything from, you know, being able to access the data, and I'll get into this a little bit later, what does the analytics loop look like? But uh, so just emphasizing here that ideally for university deployment of learning analytics, it's important that there's a system level coordinated response that encourages and fosters some of this bottom-up activity as well, but a support layer is needed. And so what does this look like? So let's say you do have a system level response. Now, we've had this discussion going on in the discussion thread uh, in Canvas, but there are a variety of data sources that a university has access to. It's not complete. We, uh, the scope of data capture for learning analytics is a significant challenge that I, I think needs to be addressed to improve the quality of analytics. But right now, data sources can include student information systems, learning management systems, if they're using library student uh, swipe cards, might even include social media, and uh, any contact point, any interaction that exists with the student and the, uh, the institution. And this then, in one way or another, gets put into a combination of, uh, of databases, and these then are mined to understand or to gain some insight into what's happening. And it might be something as simple as looking at, you know, how does the progression of courses through a program contribute to success, or social network analysis, or what are the factors of learner preparedness by looking through the student information system and seeing, you know, the, the profiles or the skills of uh, the grades of learners in high school, how did that contribute to their success? Uh, you know, what does early help-seeking behavior, how is that related to student success down the road as well? Is it a positive thing if we see a student that's willing to ask help, you know, it, it can influence design activities such as, well, we know that when students ask for help early, they typically do better if they get their answers questioned, so we have to, their questions answered, sorry, and uh, so we have to start improving the effectiveness of the help-seeking behavior and encourage individuals to be active or more active in asking questions. And so there's a variety of roles for this. It can be learner self-awareness. How are you positioned based on other learners in your course? Who's logged on more? Uh, who's read, you know, are you, where's your reading of articles in relation to other students? If you're, let's say, in the bottom, you know, 10% of students for access time, then uh, maybe the system can notify you and, and just say, look, you know, most students are reading more than what you are. We found there's a correlation between student reading and time on task and grades and so on. So it's just another source where you can start to help learners be aware of themselves. One area that hasn't really been looked at, and it was raised in the discussion forum today, is about using analytics to improve the design process. So quality analytics will help the learning designers improve what they do in design and curriculum. And you might find that time after time, the same learning activity is resulting in student disengagement or after they've completed a certain tutorial, students do worse than if they didn't complete that tutorial. So these are the kinds of points of feedback that can be particularly helpful for the university, for the course designers. And then still back to that holy grail that comes right back to the rich articles in the uh, rich article in the late 70s is about personalizing and adapting the learning experience so that individuals get what they need in terms of their learning, not what they already know. So avoid duplication, improve the quality of that experience. Now, going on to a few final slides. Um, this one, uh, I think it, it's a little bit, uh, the formatting is a bit off, but I think it's still largely functional. So this is a, just a view of what does it look like then at a university level if someone's going to deploy an analytics project systemically. How does this go about? And uh, basically just lists sort of a variety of five different approaches, including you know the strategy that is being uh, pursued, why is this happening? What's the problem or opportunity that's being targeted? What, are, what about data access? That's probably one of the biggest ones. You can have a great learning analytics project plan, but if you find that your end users have to jump through a lot of hoops to get access to data that's needed, you'll have a challenge. This gets back to the earlier question on the analytics team, the sources, the budget, 
and policy issues. I can't overstate policy issues because there are significant policy implications when you start to think in data. And that has to do with ethics and access and even just decision making approaches. Now the third area which we'll spend, we won't spend too much time on these two elements. The first two columns are not really a part of this course and uh, neither are the last two columns. But the, the central, central column is one that we're going to spend several weeks on but that's looking at metrics and tools. And what are the tools that we need that the educator controls or what are the tools that we need that is enterprise level that can do analysis work across multiple data sources and provide faculty and others with important or relevant information. There's a variety of challenges though around capacity development. It's unrealistic to expect that individuals that were university systems are able to seamlessly transition into learning analytics space without a fair bit of capacity development. And this is something I think the rare university has recognized this and done this. I've heard some of the activity coming out of University of Central Florida has, uh, has been quite good. They've been an early partner, an early uh, participant in this space and they've spent a lot of time in terms of developing or ramping up their skills and capacity. And then finally, there's a variety of things around uh, changing the model of education. Again, that's beyond the scope of this course, but ultimately it's my view that analytics, when sufficiently developed, will replace the course model of learning. That doesn't mean they'll replace the university, but you'll end up with something that is more like a competency or an outcomes-based model. And I don't think we're very far from that. I, I would put that on the, uh, you know, three to five year cycle until we have at least a series of uh, developed pilots and approaches. Might be longer until it's broadly deployed, but uh, we're definitely moving forward quickly. Final slide of significance, and then in the last slide, just a couple quick points, is uh, what does the analytics model look like? So great, you've, you've spent a little bit of time thinking about, let me just go back here, you spent some time thinking about the need for systems level analytics projects, you looked at your data sources and some of the questions you're asking and what you want to see come out of it. You've also spent some time at a systems level looking at strategic and resource allocation tool issues, capacity development, how do you actually go about doing this and there are a lot of analytics models so this certainly isn't the only one but I just want to emphasize the a few of the important elements that are involved as universities or schools begin to move into an analytics model. Collection and acquisition critical obviously if you can't get access to the data you can't make sense of it. Uh, storage, I mean storage and cleaning, I can lump those two together, but chances are if you're going to use more than one data source, even if you're using one data source, you're going to have uh, issues. So there's a fair bit of cleaning that will likely be required and pulling data sets together. I think we had a bit of an exchange on this on um, the learning analytics list uh, Google group actually, uh, where uh, there was uh, some information shared on the um, a project that was Gates funded that looked at a variety of university systems and getting that data probably normalized would be the best way to put it uh, together and just the huge challenge that that was and I think John uh, Whitmer also replied to uh, that discussion as well. So uh, this is where re really you're looking at it's great that you have the data but if it's unstructured, if it's, uh, if it's messy data or if you have data from different data sources that you haven't managed to somehow meaningfully connect layer over um, gets back to the, the um, article that mentioned during our Tuesday session, the Dan Southers article about fragmented analytics sources and the difficulty that pre presents to the researcher or to the academic or to just the teacher in a classroom, that's really the heart of the issue here is how do you get the data in a format that is useful for analysis. This is where things like integration, you know, comes in. How do you bring these multiple data sets into something that looks coherent? What kinds of, uh, you know, analysis tools are you doing? Is it, you know, natural language processing, social network analysis? Are you trying to track competent or concept development in the part of students or prediction? I mean, maybe that's part of the goal. You're trying to determine who's going to be at risk and who, who won't be at risk and so on. 
Visualization, also a critical aspect of it. You can have terrific quality data. You can have a good quality of analysis. But if that isn't rendered into something that's meaningful to an end user who might not be technically advanced, then chances are you just spent a fair bit of time that wasn't uh, very productive. And then, of course, that relates to the action portion of it. And so uh, just want to emphasize again the importance of being able to pull some of those elements together into doing something different within the university context. So there you have a rapid run through. As I mentioned earlier, the cases and examples of learning analytics are going to be addressed next week. And then the following week, we'll get specifically into a variety of tools and techniques. So I'll pause here just to see if there are any questions or comments at this stage. There are a few folks uh, typing away, so I'll wait for just a second. Um, well, I mean, practical examples, I should mention that's our entire topic next week. Uh, so we will get into a variety of examples of universities and uh, different systems. What have they done? Everything from you know, predictive analytics to, uh, let's say, degree compass, which Desire to Learn recently purchased that would track how students move through a particular program and how the courses that they take based on their profile contribute to their success. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so anyways, we will get into that next week. And so feel free to have, uh, you know, dive into the conversation that week. Uh, for the sake of time, I mean, I didn't pack every everything into this presentation. So rather than going into a variety of examples, we thought that would be worth an entire week. And, and I think you'll find all of those to be practical examples of what universities have done and what kind of an impact it's had. Uh, how much data do you think you need? Uh, you know, Pat, it, unless I, you know, that's hard to answer without knowing the discipline or what it is that you're trying to do. But I would say if you have you know, any data point that is larger than what you can process in your head is worth a learning analytics approach. Now, you can have larger than what you can process in your head with five people in a Moodle discussion forum because of, or in an LMS forum that captures, you know, times that they logged in, how much time they spent on a particular task, the nature of that, that network analysis, and so on. So even if you have a handful of students, those, and, and if you can't, make sense of those data trails without spending hours and hours digging through through your logs. And literally, you can have hundreds of thousands of data points in, uh, in a, you know, one week of a course with only a few students. So yeah, I'll just go back. Whatever you can't process in your head is worth a learning analytics look from an educational perspective. Uh, Alex asks, where in the circle would uh, uh, PAR fit in? Now, uh, that one was, was the one that I mentioned. It was the discussions on the learning analytics list. But uh, so where in this circle? I think PAR in particular actually did a good chunk of this. Uh, they, they did the uh, analytics and the collection acquisition. They used a variety of different university system data. And as a result of uh, that data, they were able to look at how are they going to store it? How are they going to you know, clean it, integrate it? And, and that took an enormous part of that project, pulling together the, because different universities use the same language to mean different things or use different language to mean the same thing. So uh, as I understood from chatting with, uh, with Phil and uh, also with uh, Ellen, the time spent making normalizing that data, if you will, was, was one of the biggest components of it because the language use was so different from university to university. Now, they once they did, you know, these, so the so best way to look at it is PAR likely did this. Now, the opportunity, of course, for analysis, which they've done a bit of, obviously, and a few other activities uh, that relate to that, not as much with the representation and visualization for end users, but definitely there'll be impact from an action perspective. So short answer is I would say PAR really fit into those elements. Yes, and PAR is ongoing. Um, I know that they've continued to expand their, the number of university partners that they have involved. And uh, I think it has strong potential because they've gotten millions of data points. And so they definitely will, will get interesting insights coming out of that initiative. Uh, Cynthia, yes, I, I will post the link to the presentation once it's done. And I'll also post the PowerPoint if, if anyone's interested. 
Are there good examples of tools focusing data ownership of students themselves? Uh, ben, no, there aren't enough of those. Uh, usually what I refer people to is uh, the quantified self movement because uh, quantified self, and if you go to the website, there's just a mess of resources or tools or other things that uh, you can use to make sense of just your own biometric data, your habits, your diet, your, your spending, you name it. And in a lot of cases, people who are active in social media do a lot of tracking of themselves. So it might be, might be through tracking a tag in a course, or it might be through Google Alerts or whatever. I mean, there was a period where there's a variety of analytics tools that were very irritating but uh, quite popular as well. So we don't, I'm not familiar with a lot of quantified self tools that target learning, but they're definitely there. I'm not aware of vendors that are actively building these out either, even though I have emphasized that anything that a university sees about a learner, a learner should be able to see as well. I think that's important. So you need to have student-facing analytics, not just institution-facing analytics. Okay, looks like we don't have any additional questions, so thanks very much for logging in. And uh, we have a couple of guest presenters next week. The uh, forum or the list of speakers will go up shortly, and uh, we'll make that available for, for you to, and we'll do that for the balance of the course as well. I just posted today as well for those of you that didn't receive the email yet, but if you want to start playing with Tableau, software, you can download that now and begin poking around. We will release some tutorials related to it in week three, and we also have a variety of more technical tools if interested. So again, thanks all. Have a great week, and we'll chat next week.